Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Check-ins. Um, 5% nervous, a uh, little like giggly, like a boyish giggliness, if I can use, if I can make up that word. Um, so yeah, welcome to the STOA. My name is Peter Limberg. I'm the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And uh, Today was uh, interesting because we just organically, a bunch of events emerged that either had Jordan Peterson's name in it or were directly about Jordan Peterson. So I thought, you know what, let's just put the, uh, the title uh, of, of the symposium on the series of events. And then, you know, uh, with a, a little bit of cuteness, we called it, let us maybe get triggered by Jordan Peterson symposium. Um, so for those of you who are new at the STOA, because we have about 70 people uh, RCP and about 46 are here right now. Uh, full disclosure, Jordan Peterson was my therapist for two years before he became a, a superstar, a famous superstar. Um, so I have a great love for him, but this does not mean I uh, agree with everything he said, uh, says, it's needless to say, but I do think it's interesting to have, uh, or important and interesting to have a conversation about some of the ideas he's presented. And I was talking to Raven, it feels tone deaf having this with all these riots going on in America. Um, but a lot of this has been booked before what was happening. Uh, so I'm sensitive to that and uh, mindful of it as well. Uh, and so Raven is going to be our MC for the day and she can introduce herself, introduce today's speaker and how it's going to go down. Uh, and then after uh, this event at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we have a, a myth and mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson from the, the people who had the Dr. Jordan Peterson .ca team. Uh, and then at 6 p.m. we have the filmmakers of the, uh, the rise of Jordan Peterson. Um, we're going to have a screening and a sense making session. And then Akira the Don is going to come in at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. He's going to have a, a meaning wave session. So you're going to jam listening to uh, Jordan Peterson and, and awesome music. So that being said, I'm going to hand it over to everyone's favorite Blackbird, Raven Connolly. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, it was interesting because um, with, with the riots going on, I, I felt like actually having Chloe here was almost the, the perfect person to open up the symposium, to draw in um, the wisdom of, of Jordan Peterson and the theory of enchantment as it relates to the current political and spiritual crises that we're seeing right now on the streets of America. And so I feel like deeply honored and, and grateful that we made this, we made this arrangement for you to come on today and um, talk about the theory of enchantment and how it relates to the current crises that we have going on right now. So thank you so much, Chloe, for being here. Uh, deeply appreciate it. Pleasure. And if thank you would you like to, me. of course, and if you would like to introduce yourself for everybody here. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Chloe Valdery. I am 26 years old. I uh, created a startup called Theory of Enchantment roughly a year ago. And the purpose of this startup is really to teach people how to build character um, and to develop character amidst the chaos and complexity of the human condition. So Chloe, can we, I wanted to go through um, the three main principles of the mm -hmm. theory of enchantment and relate those to what you're seeing right now on, on the streets of, of, our, of our country. So the first one, if you don't mind if I read it. Sure. We are human beings, not political abstractions. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason, and I tweeted about this this morning, there's a reason why that's the first principle because it's foundational. And if people don't understand this and people don't internalize this and really center this principle in their activism and in their understanding about how to sustain democracy, um, then there will be challenges and there will be a great deal of trouble. And I think we're seeing that right now with regard to some of those who have hijacked a lot of the protests um, within the streets of America. Um, uh, people are unfortunately, some people are, you know, adopting very dehumanizing language um, in the way that they're protesting. They're saying, you know, F white people, F the police, 
Um, and so they're, what they're essentially doing is they are reducing individuals, human beings, to certain abstractions, whether that's an abstraction based on race, whether that's an abstraction based upon a uniform that a man or a woman wears. And as a result, they are obscuring the fact that these people are human beings who are, and, and you know, we asked the question in the course, in the theory of enchantment course, what does it actually mean to be human? It means that you are imperfect. It means that you are flawed. It means that you are multidimensional, which means you have the capacity to do good and the capacity to do evil. And this capacity exists within every single one of us. Uh, and so if one is not cognizant of this, one can lose themselves in their activism. One can end up becoming the very thing that they seek to, to overcome. Um, and this is really an inflection point in our country's history and a moment where we have to make sure uh, that we don't do that and we don't fall into the nihilistic chaos of saying, you know, well, everything's hopeless anyway, and we're never going to change anything. So we should say, screw it and tear it all down. Because the fact of the matter is that what it also means to be human is to be able to rise above your circumstances, is to be able to maximize your full potential. And it's to be able to have the necessary emotional and spiritual maturity to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. That's also what makes being human special and the human condition special. So it's very, very important that people understand that first principle. Absolutely. The second principle, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down or destroy. So yes, obviously also this is a very, <laughs> It's a very, um, very appropriate principle for what's happening um, right now, but it's, it's, it's for both the person being criticized and also the person doing the, uh, or, or doling out the criticism. And this, this sort of relates to my um, understanding of, of the way the world works. I should back up for a bit and I should say the theory of enchantment, the uniqueness of it is that I use both developmental psychology and pop culture to teach it. And I think this is where I, I sort of overlap with a lot of what Jordan Peterson does, because obviously, you know, in Maps of Meaning, for example, he brings in Pinocchio and he brings in many of the great myths of, of cultures from all around the world to really um, create a framework, an ethical framework. And that's what I try to do as well. And so the second principle is very much related to my belief in the fact that the central teaching in the Lion King, which is about the circle of life, which is about how we are interconnected to each other, which is about how if I do something wrong, it doesn't only affect you, it affects the people that you affect, it affects tenfold uh, beyond myself. And so the second principle is not just about um, rooting our intentions in a good place when we criticize others, um, because that's important and I think that's a morally sound position, but it's also about the fact that if you don't do that, you actually end up compounding the situation, right? So if you see someone engaging in bad behavior, right, this is a perfect, perfect example for our current time. If you see a, a, a police in uniform engaging in bad behavior, um, first of all, you know nothing about the individual in the uniform. You don't know if this person was in war at one point and had PTSD and had unhealed PTSD and is now in the police force, right? You don't know anything about the background of this person. You don't know anything about the baggage of this person. You don't know anything about the weight that this person is carrying. The only thing that you know about this person is the moment that you are experiencing with this person. And so if you see, or if you hear of someone engaging in, in unjust actions, what you should not do is criticize that person in such a way that tears them down. You want to make sure your criticism is rooted in a way that lifts and uplifts everyone involved. Um, and this is something that Dr. King taught, you know, obviously in his ideas about how to create the beloved community. Um, but what you end up doing if you don't do this is you compound the situation because if you tell someone, and Maya Angelou talked about this, if you tell someone they are nothing over and over again, they will say to you, oh, you think I am nothing? I will show you where nothing is. And then they will become even worse than what you have accused them of being. And the moral of the story is that a person cannot develop character unless they are valued. And this seems counterintuitive because if someone is acting incorrectly towards you personally, 
it's very hard to say to yourself, oh, I'm going to criticize you and I'm going to correct you not only because what you are doing is unjust, but I'm also going to correct you because I care about you. I'm also going to correct you because I know that you have more potential than what you are doing right now. And I'm going to speak to that potential and I'm going to speak to your capacity to rise to your higher self. It's very difficult to do that, which really, I think, um, sort of illustrates how truly radical the civil rights movement was. Because as a reminder, people during the civil rights movement literally studied stoicism, right? And trained themselves not to fight back when desegregating diners. And the purpose of this was twofold. From a strategic perspective, if the state is uh, using repressive force against you and it creates an image of violent state versus nonviolent peaceful protesters, the, bout, the, the, the scales in terms of moving public opinion towards civil rights tips in your favor as a nonviolent protester, that's number one. But number two, from a spiritual perspective and from a moral perspective, the idea was we are going to embody the principles we seek to facilitate in this society. So we cannot drag down another human being even as we are criticizing their wrong behavior. And we recognize that if a person is caught up and engaged in wrong behavior, they are also trapped in that wrong behavior. So we speak to the, again, the possibility of human beings, and this is the nature of the human condition, to rise above not only their situations, but to rise above the immoral behavior that they're engaging in at the present moment. So that's really the, the, the idea behind the second principle. And the third principle, lead with love and compassion. Yes, so this is sort of the culmination of the theory of enchantment, um, very much like the second principle inspired by uh, Dr. King and Dr. King's philosophy of agape love and using agape love um, which is a concept that originates from Christianity um, and really is all about this idea that you love a person simply because they were made in the image of God and you love a person simply because they are a human being. You do not love a person because of their behavior. Um, you do not love a person because you agree with every single thing that they do, but because, but because simply they are human beings. And, and by rooting everything you do in love and compassion, again, you embody the values that you wish to see perpetuated in society. And one of the things that I love to teach or to use as a tool for teaching this particular concept um, in the theory of enchantment sort of lexicon is uh, a pop culture favorite of mine, which is the story of Moana. So Moana is one of the great, I, I personally think it's one of the greatest Disney movies, um, certainly in contemporary times ever made. But Moana is, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it, but so this is a spoiler alert, but you should still watch it because it's an amazing film. Um, but what's brilliant about Moana is that Moana differs from many of the other Disney heroes. So a lot of the Disney heroes go through the classic hero's journey that folks like Jordan Peterson describe in Maps of Meaning. So the hero has to encounter a bunch of obstacles and is transformed by the encountering of that obstacle. And the hero sort of has flaws also, obviously, and have to transcend those flaws. But Moana is a very different kind of hero. Moana is simply a healer. She's literally, from the time she is born, she was put on earth to heal. That is her, that is her life's purpose. And so I'm just gonna explain the context a bit um, for you. And I, I promise I'll draw, I'll, I'll draw this to something that's happening in real life. Um, so Moana, the, the story goes that Moana is on an island and the island is dying. And the reason why the island is dying is because there was a goddess who ruled over this island named Tefiti. And Tefiti was green and lush and made everything beautiful, everything flourish. But then the heart was taken from Tefiti. And in her place arose a new goddess named Taka. And Taka was full of lava and fury and rage and some of the impulses that we're witnessing right now in the streets of America. And so the, the goal, the objective of Moana is to restore the heart of Tefiti 
to defeat to come, restore the heart of the Fifi. That, that is what the film is about. Now, at the very end, and again, you should still watch it. At the very end, when Moana confronts Tika, again, imagine it's this lava, rageful goddess just destroying everything, right? Because the island, she's making the island die. So she's holding the heart of Tafiti in her hand. And she looks at Tika. And she has this aha moment that she hadn't had in the rest of the film. And in the movie, the water is sort of alive and her, her friend or whatever. And so there's a body of water separating Taka and Moana. And Moana tells the water, let her come to me. And so the water disperses very much like a, like a Moses moment. And so Taka starts to come, again, full of rage, full of fury. Moana starts to walk to her, very, very calm, like a little too calm considering the situation, very, very calm. And she says to her a very simple thing. She says, I have crossed the horizon to find you. I know your name. They have stolen the heart from inside you, but this does not define you. And the aha moment that she has when she says this, and all of a sudden Takah sort of like stops. The aha moment that she has was that Taka and Tafiti were the same exact being. So when the heart was removed from Tafiti, she descended into rage and into um, destruction and, and started destroying everything. Moana is a, is a commentary on the, on the need for spiritual nourishment within human beings. And so once Moana returned the heart, Taka once more became Tafiti again. And this relates to the first principle, right? We have the capacity to do good. We have the capacity to do evil. It was the same exact being, the same exact being, but to copy Tafiti because the heart was removed and obviously the heart is a motif for love and compassion. Because the heart was removed, she descended into rage. And I think that's what we're seeing right now um, in this country. There is a lack of spiritual edification. There's a lack of basic this is a basic idea of love and compassion for your fellow neighbor, whether that's, whether if you're a cop, whether that's the, the, the community that you're policing, um, if you're a citizen, that's for all the people in your neighborhood, including the cops that are policing your neighborhood. There's a lack of love and compassion, and we are seeing the, the negative effects of that right now. I'm going to tell you one more story to sort of round this out about love and compassion. At the University of Florida, a few years ago, there was a neo-Nazi that came to speak. And there was a protest that ensued outside of the room. Now there was a guy named, um, his last name was Fer Randy Furness. Randy Furness at the time identified as a neo-Nazi. He had Nazi signs all over his t-shirt. It was no you know, guess who he was there to see. But in order to get to go see this person, he had to walk through the sea of protesters, right? Now, when he got to the sea of protesters, some of them started pushing him, shoving him, spitting on him, cursing him out. One person punched him in the face, causing blood to draw. Until another man, African American man, sees Randy Furness and has no idea what to do. He's seeing for the first time someone who hates him because of his skin color and has no idea what to do. And so for some reason in that, mo in that moment, he does the only thing he is moved to do, which is to say that he hugs him. And he pulls him close and he asks him the question three times, why do you hate me? Why do you hate me? Why do you hate me? And at this point, Randy Furness doesn't know what to do because the object of his hatred is now hugging him. It's not exactly what he expected. And so in that moment, he's, not, he, he's moved to do the thing that comes to him, which is to say he hugs him back. And he simply responds by saying, I don't know. And this exchange sparks a series of conversations between, between Randy Furness and the other guy's name is Aaron Courtney and other members of the African-American community. And Randy Furness has since disavowed his ties to the neo-Nazi movement. Now, what's interesting about this is if you were to look into Randy Furness's background, you would learn that he was suicidal in his, in his early 20s. 
And from, from the perspective from where I'm standing, that makes perfect sense. Because if your sense of self-worth is so empty that you are willing to kill yourself or attempt to kill yourself, then you can be easily exploited by other groups that are going to give you a cause with which to, you can derive meaning from. Right? And so I tell you that story because Aaron Courtney led with love and compassion instead of the, the, the impulse that the crowd led with. And it was almost as if when Aaron saw him, it was almost as if he had a similar moment that Moana had. It was almost as if he said to him, I have crossed the horizon to find you. I know your name. They have stolen the heart from inside you, but this does not define you. So we have to somehow find a way to center love and compassion in our discourse, to center in the, in the protests that we're seeing. It has to be holistic. It has to spread. It has to be universal. It has to be love for the Black community and love for the white community. It has to be love for the citizens and love for police officers. It has to be holistic and it has to be consistent. Otherwise, it will not work. Wonderful. So I want to invite people to begin to put their questions in the chat. Um, so if you just type it out and then I'll call on you to ask your question to Chloe. So Chloe, you've already told a few stories that I feel like have a lot of wisdom for the current moment. Um, but are there other stories that you can think of? Maybe talk about the Pinocchio story or stories that you learned from, from Jordan Peterson or Maps of Meaning that have some salient truth that can lead us to a path of redemption or hope for transcendence of this current moment? Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually, uh, a couple months ago, when COVID started happening, I watched Maps of Meaning, um, the 2013 one, no, 2017 version. And I'm actually reading Maps of Meaning now, uh, which is something. Uh, so um, it's definitely a tour de force. Um, in terms of stories that, that Jordan Peterson has told that really resonate with me, I think, yeah, when he broke down Pinocchio, you know, I watched Pinocchio first, and then I watched his analysis. And it, it's crazy to me, because the thing that stands out about Pinocchio that most people know Pinocchio for is the fact that when he lies, his nose extends, right? Which is like the least important and least interesting aspect of Pinocchio. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me was Jordan Peterson's explanation of when Pinocchio was carted off to Pleasure Island. Because I think we're seeing parallels of that uh, with regards to some of the hijackers of the protest. When, when Pinocchio was carted off to Pleasure Island and was encouraged by the stagecoach to basically wreak havoc, to destroy, um, they were, him and sort of the other boys were encouraged to destroy a, a home to just throw bricks into the, it's like crazy how much of a one-to-one -one correlation there is here, but they were encouraged to just, just uh, sort of devolve into nihilistic frenzy and destroy everything because nothing matters. The only thing that matters is what's immediate. The only thing that matters is your feeling of pleasure, right? In this moment, right? And that's why it's called Pleasure Island. But of course um, it was all a con because the stagecoach was involved in a sinister plot to slowly but surely change these young boys into literal donkeys and to cart them off into slavery. And it is, it is an incredible metaphor for what happens when we lose ourselves to the base instincts that we have within us because we do have, have those impulses within us. When we lose ourselves um, and when we are not capable of controlling ourselves, um, we turn into slaves, essentially. And it's so ironic because this is, this is a, you know, what we're talking about right now in the country, a cause that is first and foremost trying to advance principles of liberty, right? How do we bring about justice in police forces? How do we ensure that police officers understand that the, the demand to protect and to serve applies not only to would-be victims, but also the criminals that you have in your, in your, they are under your concern, they're under your jurisdiction the moment you arrest them. You also have an obligation to protect and serve them as well, even though you obviously have to do 
your duty and, and, and get them into, into a specific place. And so this question is, how do we pursue justice? How do we actually create a society that is rooted in liberty? And yet we have people who are descending into madness and descending into lawlessness and becoming slaves to their own passions and becoming slaves to this impulse and this instinct to be nihilistic. So that's a philosophically inconsistent and morally inconsistent way to bring about justice. Um, and I think that the Pinocchio story um, really, really sort of uh, promotes that and that idea and really shows that idea. Um, but the other thing that it shows, and, and this is also true, I think, of Sleeping Beauty, which I also rewatched recently, is that the hero has to make sacrifices. And it is, it is the hero's job to basically look chaos in the eye and create order out of it. And I think that this is also the artist's task, right? Is to create meaning out of just destruction and chaos and malevolence. That is the, that is the job of the artist, that is the job of the hero, that is the job of the leader. Um, I'm, I, I wrote a newsletter uh, or I published a newsletter today um, that really was studying the movie Black Panther actually, uh, because I think, I think Black Panther has incredible wisdom for this moment right now in our, in our country. Um, because it juxtaposes two different sets of principles within the characters of King T'Challa and Killmonger. Killmonger is, Killmonger was abandoned, he's the villain, he was abandoned, um, he was left to rot, he was neglected, and so what happens, he internalizes that sense of abandonment, he internalizes that sense of neglect, and he rages, and he becomes destructive, and he becomes homicidal and suicidal, you know, he destroys everything, everything that comes before him, even from his ancestors, right? And T'Challa, who's the king, who's the rightful king, has to say to his father, what you did when you abandoned him was, was horrible. Like you, this is a monster of our own creation, right? Um, so it acknowledges the rage that Killmonger has and it acknowledges the sense of despair that he has, but it also says, but this is not the way. This is not the way. If you have malice in your heart and hatred in your heart, you are unfit to be king. And that is the, one of the most prominent lessons within Black Panther. So the, so the hero is able to correct his father's, his father's uh, rule, so tradition, when tradition doesn't work or tradition needs to be updated, right? This is something that Jordan Peterson talks about a lot. Um, when the tyrant father needs to sort of be updated in terms of how he behaves, you have to have the hero, which is the birth of both tradition and chaos, right? So the new and the old coming together to create a new and better balance. And that's what T'Challa represents. Um, and, and that's why he has to make sure that Killmonger doesn't, doesn't usurp the throne. But that's some of the ways in which Jordan Peterson in particular, and a lot of pop culture in general has influenced my work. Awesome, thank you. And we've got some really great questions coming up in the chat. I'd like awesome. to start with Frank's question. So Frank, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question to Chloe. Uh, thank you, Raven. Um, hi, Chloe. Uh, so hi. I've been following you on uh, Twitter for a while and I find your perspective quite refreshing. Um, so my question for you is uh, very straightforward. Uh, why is it called the theory of enchantment? Why enchantment? So, so great question. Um, background information on how the theory of enchantment developed. I was at the Wall Street Journal for a year in 2015. Uh, I was working on a thesis paper. My background in, from, from a college perspective is, is conflict resolution vis-a-vis -vis, like international studies. I was working on a paper on this topic and um, there was no, you know, there was all this co conversation of how to get people to stop conflict, which is to say, how do you get people to stop hating? And I realized that there was no framework within international studies to ask the question of how do you get people to start loving? And these two are not the same questions. They're interrelated questions, but they're not the same questions. And I wanted to create a framework that teaches people how to love. And so then I thought to myself, well, what if I asked, what are people already in love with? And then use that to create a framework for teaching people how to love. And the thing that people were in love with was pop culture. 
And so I then started to study pop culture to see if there was a common denominator across various different influencers and companies and celebrities in terms of the content that they were producing, but there was a theme. I studied companies like Nike, I studied artists like Beyonce, um, I studied companies like Disney, and the common denominator was all of these entities and influencers are creating content where their audience sees themselves and their potential reflected in the content. And that's why we buy it. And so, you know, Disney played a huge role, actually, ultimately in informing my decision to make it, to call it enchantment. But the, the real source of why I called it enchantment was because of a book I read uh, called Enchantment by Guy Kawasaki, who is the former marketing director of Apple. And he defines enchantment as the process by which you delight someone with a concept, with an idea, um, or with just you know, your own personality. And I found that idea of delight very intriguing um, and very much a beautiful thing because these, when I think of delight, when I think of enchantment, I think of the, I, this concept of wonder. And I think that one of the things we're losing in, in our societies in the West is our sense of wonder. And this is related to the fact that we're, not, we're no longer speaking we're, not, we're no longer talking in a way that speaks to people's potential, right? That's all, that's all related. Potential, wonder, delight, enchantment, love. These are, these are words that are missing increasingly from my vocabulary. And so to call it enchantment um, was really my attempt to try to bring, to, to bring those ideas back into the fold. So I'm based in India and uh, they are missing here as well. So yeah, beautiful answer. Thank you. Pleasure. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Jacob, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, so um, since you're talking a lot, well, this is all about Jordan Peterson, right? And so it made me think of Nietzsche's hammer. He took a hammer to things. And so, and then the wisdom of Solomon says, there's a time to tear down and a, a time to build up. So you say never tear down, and maybe you don't mean never, but if you do mean never, then it seems like, well, have you, here, here's the question. Sure. Have you considered the need for a distinction between tearing down the person, so an ad hominem, tear down, tearing down the idea and tearing down the behavior? Because it seems like those things need to be parsed before sure. we say never tear down, right? Yeah. No, I definitely- so Those distinctions? I definitely mean, don't dehumanize. I think that's ultimately what I mean. So, so again, going back to the example of the leadership of those involved in the civil rights movement, one of the animating principles behind nonviolence in the attempts to desegregate the diners was based upon this concept of not dehumanizing anyone, including your enemy, because then you create or you contribute to a society that is unjust, even in the name of justice. So by tear down, I don't mean, dis I don't mean don't dismantle systems of oppression, but I am arguing that it's hard and nearly arguably impossible to dismantle a system of oppression if you are being oppressive in your language and if you're being dehumanizing toward your enemies. So that is the distinction that I would make. Excellent. I hope that that is somewhat satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next question here is Sean. Hi, Chloe. Um, Hi, Sean. I really enjoy the um, this as an ethical basis. Um, what I what I would struggle to imagine is how to apply this. Or I'm just interested in your tactics and like applying these ethics to everyday interactions with family and uh, with friends who it, it's difficult to kind of mirror their to not mirror their confrontational attitudes. Like, how do you apply this on a ground level? Well, I can tell you that I personally 
have done a lot of self work. So, so the, the theory of enchantment course um, is a full 25 lesson course. And the first part, the first one third of the course is working on the self. And so before you talk about how to have a healthy relationship with other people, the, the primary question is how you have a healthy relationship with yourself, which means understanding yourself again, as I said earlier, as a human being, um, becoming comfortable with your imperfections, not overcompensating for them, learning about your baggage, not overcompensating for them, understanding that there are certain emotions that inform your behavior. So for example, I know that when I am feeling insecure, I may sometimes act defensive. And so just understanding that about myself, I think equips me and positions me in such a way to be able to deal with others because if i know for example that if i am feeling insecure i am defensive then when people let's say when a family member is randomly seemingly randomly def acting defensive toward me and i don't understand why it could be the case that they are feeling insecure right and so then i will modify my response being cognizant of the fact that there's an emotional baggage that's informing the behavior it's 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 more in depth and so i would say the first step is you have to this is what i found you have to work on yourself and it's like a it's like a daily practice obviously um i also meditate for an hour a day um mm. and that really serves to calm down my nervous system <laughs> in general um and so yeah so just like trying to practice some of the some of the teachings in the theory of enchantment first applying them to the self and then applying them to the other um it's a long-term strategy because people don't i don't think one becomes you know avail able to to respond to confrontation with a less aggressive stance overnight that's just not how we're wired and so it takes practice, which is why, you know, so we teach stoicism in the theory of enchantment uh, uh, platform as well. So stoicism and practicing stoicism and trying to remember principles like take the view from above, take the view from below, meditate on your mortality so that you understand that these emotions that you're experiencing right now are totally fine emotions. You can experience the emotions, but you also have to learn to let the emotions pass, right? So these are very, uh, again, daily practices that I work on and that students in the theory of enchantment course work on to then be able to to be in uh, better relationships with their with other members of their society and that doesn't mean obviously that you agree because that's not the point right you don't have to agree with with everyone that you encounter um but i think the idea is to try and model that love and compassion even in the midst of profound disagreement thank you you're welcome Thank you for that question. Um, Jacob K, would you like to ask your question? Oh, Jacob, I can't hear you. How about now? Is this okay? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I found you on Twitter like two days ago, but the shit you're putting out is really um, high quality. So, <laughs> um witnessing this big kind of mimetic wave kind of around the blackout tuesday on instagram and associated mm -hmm. with that of a lot of people mostly um white friends mm -hmm. putting their willingness to listen and learn mm -hmm. um and then I, I don't know if you're familiar with the evergreen state mm -hmm. yep. thing okay that makes it easy so kind of this unease that i'm feeling of like well, who, who is it that it's not clear who's being listened to and what it is that you're going to be learning? Um, okay. And then there's just the signaling of your willingness to do it, but it's not clear what um, and like from what kind of emotional state is that coming from? Sure. Yeah, I'm just feeling a lot of confusion around that meme wave and also a sense of like, posting anything which is trying to speak to that and kind of complexify it is going to be very um unwelcome sure i mean i can be flamed i can tell you personally that i really like this is just me personally i'm not 
making a judgment call on others who choose to do this. I, I think it's like, I don't really care about it, you know, because it is, it is a, this meme thing that's happening specifically today is a, I think it's, I think it's uh, confined within a certain time, time situation. It's, it's going to be on to the next subject tomorrow. Um, you know, I think it's slightly performative. I, I do think that a lot of people are coming from a sincere place when they post these things. I'm not everyone is, but a lot of people are, and I acknowledge that sincerity. I honor that sincerity, but I, I am a little, like, that's just not me. That's not what I'm about. I don't think that that's meaningful, really. Um, I also am, like, really weirded out by, like, white people genuflecting and, uh, and doing a very strange sort of, like, like, tell us what we should do because we are white and you are black. I, I find that very much antithetical to the, to the, first of all, the point of the pursuit of justice and to the spirit of the first principle of the theory of enchantment. Um, because the idea that I have some sort of uh, holy knowledge merely because I am black is silly. Um, and the idea that a white person has nothing to contribute to the conversation merely because they are white is also silly. Uh, because again, this is, this is the whole human beings, not political abstractions sort of situation. Um, so that's just me. That's like my, that's my natural response to it. But I'm also just not, like, I don't think it's necessary to entertain everything that's happening on social media, especially because it's here today and gone tomorrow. You know, this, I, I don't consider this to be like, this Instagram thing, like a movement on par with, you know, the Arab Spring or something we, we remember in history. And I just, I just think it's fickle and, and that's not worth my entertainment. That doesn't mean I'm gonna, I'm not gonna like speak out against it, but I, I'm, I'm more indifferent to it than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Rain, would you like to ask your question? Are you out there, Rain? <laughs> oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm on my iPad and not as familiar with it. Um, there I am. Uh, thank you, Chloe. So uh -huh. appreciating your stance. And uh, someone else said it's refreshing, and I feel the same way. Uh, my question is one that I know has been asked many times, and I'm sure there's some good thought on it, but I haven't sure. really studied the civil rights movement, but just the question of um, if you're really committed to this peaceful form of protest, what's to stop people who have the power from simply ignoring the peaceful protests? So that's a great question. There's a study that came out at Cambridge University, I think last week, that uh, demonstrated the how the nonviolent protests of the civil rights movement actually move the needle in terms of public um, opinion um, compared, as compared to the violent protests, sort of the violent riots that took place in the late 60s. And what they found was that, first of all, if whenever there's violence, there will be media attention. And so the reason why the nonviolent protests move the needle is because of the juxtaposition between state violence and the peaceful protesters. Because it was such a sharp dichotomy, because it was obvious, like it was like obviously and ironically uh, clear which camp was being civilized and which camp was being uncivilized, that actually helped uh, uh, push the needle forward in terms of public opinion. So I think everything we've seen with regard to media coverage sort of almost guarantees that if there is violence, there will be, there will be coverage. And we've, because we've seen up till now a precedent of police forces overdoing it in many, many uh, cases and with regards to protests around the country. Um, and we, because we see in some places uh, state violence against peaceful protesters, we know that the media is there, the media is gonna cover it. So then the, then the question becomes, okay, so what is, 
the as activists and as protesters, how do we comport ourselves, given that we know that in the past this is what moved the push the public opinion forward? How do we comport ourselves, and how do we not only from a moral perspective, obviously, but also from a strategic and tactical perspective, create this juxtaposing image of um, uncivilized, i.e., the state versus civilized? And so I think that that's enough of a of a reason to consider, at the very least. Uh, uh, comporting yourself as an activist in that way, because we have we have precedent, we have evidence that it did work. It did work in the past. Thanks. And and just a quick follow up. I know there's some evidence that in certain contexts, uh, violent action um, affects change. And and do you do you think those? Have you studied the research? Do you think that those results are non-representative? or have other um, negative effects? Well, I think it would depend upon where, it, it depends on so many factors, right? It depends on, on when you say violence, are you saying people are getting beaten up? Are you saying stores are being looted? Are you saying um, uh, uh, people are destroying uh, businesses? And what, so what is, what is the nature of the violence, number one, and what is the goal? And so I would have to, to, to be on, like to seriously and honestly like grapple with that question, I would have to know more specific details. Um, but I do believe in thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? So, so I, I do understand and sympathize with, I actually received this question today. I was on a phone call with Glenn Greenwald and I received the question about the wisdom or lack thereof of not people who are just being nihilistic and you know, looting stores, but people who, who sincerely feel rage and despair. And the question was, well, wh what do I say to those people? And I, I think my answer was, I truly sympathize, but I do believe that if we as activists want to create a just society, we cannot afford to descend into despair because I don't know, I don't know what happens after that. It's like, what next? You know, um, and also it's obviously easy for someone to call me a hypocrite if I say that I believe in justice, but I don't apply justice consistently across the board. You know, I, I think I think it's easy to get caught up in in rage and despair and in the middle of a protest say f white people, but I also find that fundamentally immoral, right? And so um, I think we have to we have to try our best to be our, our higher selves. So, but again, I'm I'm definitely willing to grapple with um, the impact of 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 violent uh, protests and counter protests, and 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 I think I, I don't think I'll necessarily have a concrete answer to that, but I'm definitely interested in continuing continuing to grapple with it. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see how many more questions we can get in. <laughs> Khalil, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes. Um, I feel kind of bad for kind of derailing the conversation. I think it was going in a good direction. And I just want to say thanks to Peter and Raven and Chloe for making this happen. Um, so my question is, uh, can you conceive of such a thing as like um, over enchantment or hyper enchantment? It seems like um, today our problem is like excess rather than not enough. It might be very easy for people to find enchanting characters online and just sure. hyper stimulate themselves and never actually like kind of outsource their lives to characters. I'm wondering if sure. you could connect such a thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I. I don't know that I can control. I think what I hope to do is to inspire people to practice, cert to, to, to develop certain practices within their life um, that enables them to fortify their character and fortify strength of character. And to the extent that someone is outsourcing that work to, you know, just, I don't know, retweeting me then they're not doing what I'm trying to inspire to do, them to do. Um, and that, I don't, 
it, that might be my fault, actually. I don't know if that that would be my fault. I, I don't know the extent to which we can say that, you know, we are autonomous beings and on some level we have to take responsibility for our actions. And obviously what you're describing is always a risk. But all I can say is I will try to do my best to inspire people to do the work themselves, um, which is why Theory of Enchantment is a course, is an actual like uh, rigorous course, as opposed to just, you know, a series of tweets and retweets. Um, but no, I think it's a good point. And I think I should, I should be on guard and, and not fall into to the trap and to, to check myself and to make sure that I am, you know, um, inspiring people to actually take action. Thank you. I just want to make it clear that I wasn't um, suggesting that you were guilty of this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Great. Let's see here. We have a question about reading suggestions. Um, oh, here's here's one from Benjamin that he asked me to ask you. Sure. Given that Peterson is controversial, have you had to deal with any difficulties due to your appreciation for his work? Have you had to defend your appreciation? If so, what has worked? Also, what is the best way to support your work? Boost your signal. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Um, so I'll just answer that one first. Um, um, I guess I can, can I post in the chat actually? Um, so here is Theory of Enchantment's website. So you can check out a lot of our uh, stuff, the courses up there and just our philosophy and like approach to, to life. Um, in terms of Jordan Peterson, it's interesting. I actually haven't uh, gotten flack yet. You know, I'm sure that that will come up at some point. Um, I, was, well, I was the moderator of questions for the film uh, premiere of The Rise and Fall of Jordan Peterson. So I actually know those filmmakers. Um, and I was part of the premiere here, here in Brooklyn a couple months ago in December. And so even then I didn't get any, weirdly enough, I didn't, I didn't get any flack. I think that the reason perhaps why I haven't gotten any flack is because I think Jordan Peterson comes, you know, from a long line of a certain type of philosopher slash psychologist I've put in, a, in the same camp as Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and, and, um, and, uh, Camille Paglia, for example, I actually think uh, Camille Paglia is kind of superior, but don't beat me up for that one. Um, but uh, but I also bring in, of course, a lot of pop culture and in, into the conversations that I have when I'm talking about Jordan Peterson. Um, and what's funny enough is it's almost as if I'm basically hacking the network. And what I mean by that is Jordan Peterson is very much similar to and sometimes talks about Joseph Campbell, right? Um, obviously, a lot of his commentary when it, com when it comes to LGBTQ rights is the most controversial aspect of his work. Ironically, I think that's the least important aspect of his work. Um, but when it comes to his connection to, to folks like Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, What's interesting about this is if you were to listen to, let's say, Oprah, Oprah's podcast, Oprah's podcast mentions Joseph Campbell so many times. Like Joseph Campbell is a part of her universe and a part of her lexicon and a part of the way she thinks. And you think about how popular both Oprah and, and Jordan Peterson are. It's fascinating because there's so much overlap, right? And so my the way I hack the network, so to speak, is by threading the needle, right? And, and also by being seriously engaged in the, these ideas um, and like really grappling with them and questioning them and unpacking them and disagreeing when necessary and agreeing when necessary. So it's very difficult for people to, and people can obviously critique me and they do all the time, but it's very difficult for people to disparage, to be disparaging in their criticism because I'm trying to, encourage people to stop doing that and so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy um so i'm afraid i can't give you any, any advice um besides i besides uh just just being sincere and authentically grappling with jordan peterson's ideas but also grappling with other people's ideas who challenge jordan peterson i thought his debate with uh, zizek was quite fascinating um 
um, not wasn't really a debate, but it was quite fascinating um, to see, you know, a Marxist and and someone like Jordan Peterson really actually come to come to form certain certain parts of agreement. And I wasn't really expecting that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's all I have for that question. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that that's not as sufficient as it could be. No problem. All right. Well, we're coming to a close here, Chloe. Um, are there any final words that you would like to leave us with? Well, stay safe, uh, especially if you're, <laughs> especially if you're in the United States of America. Um, and I, I think it's really important to understand that oftentimes perception is reality. And if you perceive that things are hopeless, then you will act in a manner that indicates that things are hopeless. And if you perceive that things are possible and a, as a reminder, the human condition demonstrates to us that we are capable of, of, of overcoming our circumstances and overcoming our situations and rising above. And I can't tell you the countless stories I know personally of, you know, you know, former neo-Nazis uh, disavowing their ties to racist movements to, you want to talk about uh, Rwanda, where an entire country decided to reconcile itself with itself um, we often talk about the things that human beings do that are devastating and horrible, but we don't speak enough about the things that humans, human beings do that is incredibly resilient and incredibly transformative. And I think we need to put more of those images um, and more of those stories out into the, into the forefront of our, of our media outlets so that this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The thing about self-fulfilling prophecies is that it could be a good prophecy. We sort of use that term in a negative connotation, but it can become a good, a good prophecy. So I encourage you to, you know, check out the Theory of Enchantment uh, uh, platform. Um, and if I can be of, of help or of service to any of you, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm happy to have conversations and engage uh, to the best of my ability. But other than that, keep, keep hope alive, as my dad as my dad likes to say, keep hope alive. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here, Chloe. I can't Pleasure. think of a better way have, to have opened the, the symposium. That's beautiful. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to tell us a little bit about the upcoming events that we have going on here at the STOA. So we have it at four, uh, Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson with the team from drjordanpeterson.ca. And then later on, we have the rise of Jordan Peterson screening and sense making with the filmmakers. And after that, we have the Meaning Wave party with the DJ, Akira the Dawn. And lots more things going on this week as well. So I hope you all can join us for those events. And we see the STOA as a gift uh, for everyone in this time of need. And if you feel inspired to make a gift, you can visit us at thestoa.ca. And thank you all, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, debrief. Five minutes, Raven. Sure, you're still recording. Oh. <laughs>